2023. I am Neev Jogani, and today I'm here with my expert team, Mr. Deepan Shah and Mr. Samir Jogani. So this webinar will be divided in two parts. Firstly, we will understand and drill down into the details of the major updates in the new UA corporate tax, and then we will revise on all the major concepts of the entire law as a whole. So the UAE has always been known as a progressive business hub in the Middle East and across the world. And now it has embarked on a new journey in its fiscal policies. Uh, can everyone just please mute their mics? I think someone is, yes, thank you so much. Uh, the introduction of corporate tax represents a major shift uh, in the nation's economic framework, necessitating a comprehensive understanding of its implications on the business environment. So as the economic landscape continues to evolve, it is important for us to stay informed and proactive, ensuring that our strategies align with the new regulations and adjustments. That is why today we are here to delve deeper into this crucial topic, demystifying the nuances of the new corporate tax law and exploring its potential impacts on our businesses. Uh, at the end, we will also have an interactive session where you can pose your uh, queries and concerns. We will strongly encourage your participation as your questions will enrich this conversation leading to a more uh, comprehensive understanding for everyone. We will have this Q&A session at the end. So I advise everyone to keep noting down their questions as and when they come across one. So without wasting further time, let's dive straight into the topic. So a lot of long awaited clarity has been provided on the taxability of free zone persons from the two new ministerial decisions taken on the 1st of June, 2023, the day when the corporate tax was officially live. And from these decisions, the one thing that is absolutely clear is that it's crucial for UAE free zone businesses to distinguish between the 0% tax rate and the non-qualifying income, given the stringent implications of the non-compliance. So failure to meet the 0% tax rate conditions in one year could disqualify the business from this rate for the next four years. If during an FTA audit, which is usually carried out after five to six years, uh, if it's determined that your business didn't meet the free zone status in the preceding years, any unclaimed tax incentives over the previous four years would be revoked, lead, leading to considerable tax liabilities Hence, understanding and strictly adhering to the free zone status criteria and 0% tax rate income rules is of utmost importance. So to qualify as a free zone person under the new uh, tax regulations, business must meet several criteria. Some of these conditions were already disclosed back when the law was live uh, back in December 22. However, the ministry has recently added two new conditions uh, in their ministerial decisions. So first of all, maintaining adequate substance in the UAE derives qualifying income, has not elected to be subject to corporate tax, complies with other laws and meets conditions as may be prescribed, such as the transfer pricing regulations. Its non-qualifying revenue does not exceed the de minimis requirements and it prepares audited financial statements. So now let's look at these conditions one by one. Starting off with the first condition, uh, to qualify as a free zone person is the substance. So back when the law was published in December 22, a lot of connections and correlations had been made with the possibility that meeting this substance condition could be based on your ESR filing, which is your economic substance regulations. However, in the recent decisions, the ministry has clarified what it expects from adequate substance. Firstly, businesses core income generating activities need to be conducted within the free zone. Moreover, these businesses should have adequate assets, a suitable number of employees and substantial operating expenditure, which is proportional to their level of activities. So notably activities can be outsourced to related parties or third parties within the free zone. However, proper su supervision is uh, necessary. In essence, this provision is designed to ensure that businesses operating in the free zone doesn't misuse this free zone exemption. So say you are a free zone company, uh, which is uh, in the DMCC and are making millions of dirhams in profit. However, you don't have adequate do or deva expenses, or you do not have a necessary number of employees or machinery to undertake these events. 
and if the ministry finds out uh, in their search operations or with your periodic inspections if they find out that there is no adequate substance uh, in your office place then they might revoke this entire uh, fee zone exemption may even impose penalties and therefore adequate substance uh, along with the rise in the aml uh, provisions as well is of utmost importance in the current business scenario so moving on to the hot topic the different types of income for free zone persons and its taxability first of all qualifying income includes revenue from transactions with free zone entities revenue derived from qualifying activities conducted with a non free zone person be it local or international as an export so i'll come back to the definition and purview of qualifying activities in a moment but uh, it's important to note that all such qualifying income will be completely exempt from the tax the catch is that however whether this exemption is applicable to your company or not depends on whether the non qualifying income meets the de minimis requirements so the non qualifying income includes activities that are not qualifying activities where the other party to the transaction is a non free zone person so if you are transacting with a mainland entity or you are exporting some goods which are not considered as a qualifying activity it will be considered as a non qualifying income secondly revenue from excluded activities i'll come to these definitions one by one just to reiterate as long as the non qualifying income is below the de minimis requirement both the qualifying as well as the non qualifying income will be completely exempt from the corporate tax coming to the disqualifying income so disqualifying income is separate from qualifying and non qualifying income it will be taxed separately so any income which is earned from uh, an residential immovable property within a free zone or when the transaction is with a non free zone pro, uh, person so say you have a property or an apartment or some sort of uh, immovable property that is within the free zone and you are and you are earning any sort of income be it rent income lease income or sale uh, of such properties then it will be considered as disqualifying income uh, if the conditions are not met i'll explain it in detail uh, in further slides and secondly income from any domestic or foreign permanent establishment so any such disqualifying income will be taxed at the rate of 9% without any sort of threshold limit or uh, the de minimis requirement it will be taxed separately and it will be directly taxed at the rate of 9% so what are these de minimis requirements first of all a qualifying free zone person needs to satisfy the requirement of de minimis which requires that the non qualifying revenue does not exceed uh, the qualify the non qualifying revenue of the qualifying free zone person should not exceed 5% of the total revenue of the qualifying free zone person or 5 million dirham whichever is lower so here are the 12 different qualifying activities as specified by the ministry first of all manufacturing of goods or materials or processing of goods or materials holding of shares and other securities ownership management and operation of ships reinsurance services that are subject to regulatory oversight fund management services that are subject to regulatory oversight wealth and investment management services headquarters services to related parties treasury and financing services to related parties financing and leasing of aircraft engines and rotable components distribution of goods materials in or from a designated zone for resale so this is interpreted as a trading activity or to alter such goods or materials for sale or resale this is a very critical aspect and i'll come back to this later and lastly logistic services so coming back to point number k this is one of the most critical aspects of these decisions what's so critical about this point is that here the term designated zones only involve a specific list of free zones which excludes popular free zones such as dmcc or dafc so effectively trading is hence not a qualifying activity if the qualifying free zone is conducting it from dmcc hence not considered a qualifying income so say you are a diamond company which either exports polished diamonds to other countries uh, for trading purposes or transacts with mainland or exports rough diamond for polishing and such income is more than 5% of your total revenue or 5 million dirham whichever is lower you can no longer take the benefit of qualifying free zone person 
In other words, you will be liable to pay tax at the rate of 9% on your income over 375,000 dirhams like a normal taxable person. Furthermore, entities will not be able to take the qualifying free zone person exemption for the next five years, including the current year. So this is uh, sort of a bad news for DMCC especially. That's why we as Lemon Consultech are going to issue a representation to the ministry to uh, give some sort of exemption for trading activities in DMCC. Since DMCC is known for a lot of trading activities, hence uh, not giving an exemption to DMCC might be inappropriate in this sense. So here's a list of designated zones in Dubai, the only you know, large and popular free zones will be Jafsa and Dafsa. So any other free zones such as DIC, DMCC, DIFC are not going to be designated zone. And this is, uh, the list is as per the VAT laws, uh, which is specified back in 2018. So this is the taxability on supply of goods. So this is, this table here is a short summary of all the provisions that we saw up till now. It basically differentiates sale of manufactured goods or distribution of goods for resale for free zone persons and designated uh, person, designated zones between uh, different type of recipients. So as you can see, any transaction which includes manufacturing of goods or distribution of goods for resale or minor alteration between a free zone person or a designated free zone person to any other free zone person will always be considered as qualifying income. If the activity is of manufactured goods and the free zone person or the designated free zone person is selling to a mainland entity or to a foreign entity for an export, then all such income will again be considered as a qualifying income. However, the twist is when uh, this activity is for trading purposes, such as distribution of goods for resale or minor alteration. And it is done by a free zone person to a mainland entity or a foreign entity for export. Then such income will be considered as a non-qualifying income. However, for designated free zone persons, it will still be considered as a qualifying income. Uh, lastly, any sort of activities transacted with natural person will always be considered as non-qualifying income. I'll come back to uh, the excluded activities in the next slide. So uh, coming to the point of excluded activities, uh, excluded activities are those transactions which even if they are done from within the free zone to another free zone, or to a non-free zone person are considered as non-qualifying income. Just a second. Uh, I think there is some error in my laptop. Just a second. So any transactions with natural person except qualifying activities, which are operation management of ships, fund and investment management services, and leasing of aircraft and engines. So like I said, any transactions except these specific services will be considered as excluded activities. So even if you are doing a transaction with a free zone person within a free zone, even then these income will be considered as a non-qualifying income and will be subject to the de minimis requirement. Secondly, banking activities, insurance activities, finance and leasing activities, ownership or exploitation of immovable property other than transaction of free zone property, and ownership or exploitation of intellectual property assets such as patent, trademarks, etc. So all of these activities are considered excluded activities. Now, there are a few very specific and very crucial conditions attached to the qualifying income. So qualifying income shouldn't be connected to a domestic or foreign permanent establishment, such as a branch. So if the business management takes place on the mainland or overseas, yet the resulting transactions are reported under a free zone entity, the business could lose the 0% tax rate. So it's important, albeit challenging to practically demonstrate this condition, but this is in reference to the POEM regulations, which is the place of effective management. 
Hence, if your management is taken outside the free zone, but your transactions are within the free zone, then the government, the ministry can take back or withdraw the, for the qualifying free zone exemption that is given to you. And you might also be liable to certain penalties. Additionally, when it comes to transactions with other free zone entities, the recipient must be the beneficial recipient with no obligation to pass on the goods or services. So if you have a free zone entity with an obligation to pay to a mainland entity for any income that it gets, such a type of transaction will be considered as a non-beneficial recipient and therefore the entire free zone exemption might be withdrawn. So here is a short summary of the disqualifying income. The two primary conditions that needs to be fulfilled uh, for the income to be considered as, disc, as qualifying income is that it should be commercial property and uh, it should be sold to a free zone person. Therefore, any income attributable to transactions of residential immovable property or transactions with a non-free zone person will not be eligible for the de minimis threshold at the rate of 9% without the threshold of 375,000 dirhams as well. So as you can see, the only condition uh, where you can be, uh, your income should be considered as a qualifying income is when you're selling a commercial property like an office land to another free zone person. In all other cases, it will be taxed directly at the rate of 9% on your net income. Secondly, income attributable to any domestic or foreign permanent establishment will not be eligible for the de minimis threshold and tax at the rate of 9% without any threshold limit. So what exactly is permanent establishment? A permanent establishment in the UAE is a place of business like a branch or through people like employees or agents. It could be any kind of location, big or small, sorry, owned or rented, temporary or long-term. The law doesn't specify any particular requirements about the location. However, there are certain exemptions, exceptions uh, if a business is only doing minor tasks at a location like marketing or delivery of goods or packaging. It doesn't count as a permanent establishment. Also agents who operate independently are exempted. So if you have an agent who is handling sales uh, of your entity, uh, along with a lot of different entities at, as well, the agent will be considered as an independent agent and would not be qualified as your permanent establishment. Hence his income would not be taxable in your business income. But remember, if the activities go beyond minor tasks, then the business is considered to have a permanent establishment in the UAE. Income attributable to a domestic PE should be calculated as if the establishment was a separate and independent person and shall be subject to a tax rate at the rate 9%. However, it will not disqualify the free zone from benefiting from a 0% corporate tax rate on qualifying income. So, like I said, there are three different types of income. Qualifying, non-qualifying and disqualifying. So if your disqualifying income is exceeding the de minimis requirement, but your non-qualifying income is not exceeding your de minimis requirement, then you will still be eligible to as a qualifying free zone person. I'll explain this in detail in certain uh, real life case scenarios so that you understand this better. So here is a bird's eye view on the taxability of free zones. Qualifying income would include any activity with free zone persons, except the excluded activities, as well as qualifying activities with non-free zone persons, as long as the non-qualifying income uh, is satisfying the de minimis requirements. If it does not, it will cease to qualify as a qualifying free zone person and will be taxed at the entire net income over the threshold limit of 375,000 dirhams at the rate of 9%. Any domestic PE income or immovable property income, uh, I've explained in the previous slides itself. So moving towards the explanatory scenario one, suppose XYZ DMCC is a DMCC company engaged in the business of trading of precious stones and jewelry. XYZ is having a total income of 1.6 million in the tax period as bifurcated below. So any income from export of manufactured or processed goods is 1.1 million. Export of goods or distribution to the US for resale or minor alteration is 200,000 dirhams. Income from export of related party headquarters services, which is a qualifying activity, is 100,000 dirhams. Sale to mainland or export of any other services, such as professional services, IT services, healthcare services. Since this is not a qualifying activity, it will be considered as a non-qualifying income of 100,000 dirhams. 
And lastly, sale or export of investment management services to a natural person of 100,000 dirhams. So I've highlighted the non-qualifying income here in yellow so that it's easier for you to identify the qualifying and non-qualifying income. You might be wondering why is a sale of service to a natural person considered within this qualifying income? The answer is that even within the excluded activities, there is an exception for investment management services. Hence, any sale of investment management services to a natural person in the mainland or in a foreign country will be considered in qualifying income. Uh, suppose the net income from all of these transactions is 400,000 dirhams. Let's understand the tax liability in detail. So the total revenue in this case was 1.6 million. Uh, it will be the entire revenue since there is no disqualifying revenue in this case. The qualifying income is 1.3 million, uh, which excludes the 300,000 dirhams uh, of non-qualifying revenue, which is as explained. Is this company fulfilling the de, uh, the de minimis requirement? So the non-qualifying revenue should not exceed 5% of the total revenue, which in this case is 80,000 dirhams, which is 5% of 1.6 million dirhams. Whereas non-qualifying revenue in this case is 300,000 dirhams. Hence, XYZ is not satisfying the de minimis requirement. So will XYZ continue as a qualifying free zone person? The answer is no. XYZ will be required to pay tax at the rate of 9% for its income over 375,000 dirhams for the current year and the next four years. So the tax liability in this case uh, will be calculated like any other taxable person, which is the income over 375,000 dirhams. So in this case, it is 9% on 25,000 dirhams. The tax liability is coming to a total of 2,250 dirhams. Now, case scenario two. So say ABC DMCC is a DMCC company engaged in the business of trading of precious stones and jewelry. ABC is having a total income of 1.6 million in the tax period as bifurcated below. So distribution of goods to companies in other free zones for resale or minor alteration. Lease income of residential, residential property to a free zone person. Income from sale of commercial property to a non-free zone person income from mainland branch office, income from foreign sales agent. So in this scenario, I've highlighted all the disqualifying income in red. And only there is a single qualifying income, which is the distribution of goods to companies in other free zones. As you can recall, any transactions from one free zone to another free zone or within the same free zone will always be considered as a qualifying activity. Now say uh, that the net income excluding disqualifying activities in this case was 400,000 dirhams and the net income from disqualifying activities was 200 dirhams. Let's understand the tax liability. So the total revenue in this case would only be 1 million dirhams. That is because the entire disqualifying income would not be considered in the total revenue. It will be taxed separately. Qualifying income is again 1 million dirhams there is no non-qualifying revenue of ABC. Since it, uh, the revenue is either uh, a qualifying revenue or a disqualifying revenue, none of this income is a non-qualifying revenue. So will, the, will ABC fulfill the de minimis requirement? The answer is since the non-qualifying revenue should not exceed 5% of the total revenue, which is 80,000 dirhams in this case. And in, since non-qualifying revenue is nil, hence ABC is satisfying the de minimis requirement. So is uh, ABC going to continue as a qualifying free zone person? The answer is yes. ABC would be liable to pay corporate tax at the rate of 9%, however, on the disqualifying income of 200,000 dirhams without any threshold limit. That is 9% on 200,000 dirhams, 18,000 dirhams will be its tax liability. However, ABC is not required to pay any tax on its net income of 400,000 dirhams since ABC is still a qualifying free zone person. Now coming to explanatory scenario three. So say EFG free zone company is a DAFSA company engaged in the business of trading of metals. And EFG is having a total revenue of 1.35 million dirham, which is as bifurcated below. So the first three points, uh, there is sale of manufactured or processed goods to mainland, distribution of goods to mainland for resale or alteration, distribution of goods to the USA for resale or alteration. As you can see, DAFSA company is a designated zone. So any such trading activities as covered within point number two, 
which is uh, a trading activity to a mainland entity or point number three, which is a trading activity to another country as an export is considered as a qualifying income. Point number four is the sale of goods to natural persons. Uh, so since sale of goods uh, to a natural person is an excluded activity, it will be considered as a non-qualifying income. Income generated from sale by a local agent outside of the free zone is a permanent establishment income, which is similarly taxed uh, uh, separately and is considered as a disqualifying activity. So say from all of these transactions, the net income excluding disqualifying activity is coming to 380,000 dirhams and net income from disqualifying activity is 20,000 dirhams. So the total revenue is 1.25 million dirhams, which is the entire revenue excluding uh, the disqualifying revenue. Qualifying income of EFG is 1.2 million dirham. Non-qualifying revenue is the sale of goods to natural, natural persons, uh, which is 50,000 dirhams. So is EFG fulfilling the de minimis requirement? So the non-qualifying revenue should not exceed 5% of total revenue or 5 million dirhams, whichever is lower. So in this case, it is 5% of 1.25 million dirhams, which is 62,500 62, dirhams. Whereas non-qualifying revenue in this case is 50,000 dirhams. Hence, EFG is satisfying the de minimis requirement and will continue as a qualifying free zone person. However, EFG would be liable to pay corporate tax at the rate of 9% on the mainland agent income of 20,000 dirhams. So the net tax liability in this case will only be 1,800 dirhams. So this was all about uh, the taxability of free zone persons. Now there are also a few major updates uh, in reliefs, uh, which were released quite recently. First of all, small business relief. So any UAE resident or juridical person or individual who is not a member that is required to prepare CBCR. So country by country reporting is a sort of transfer pricing documentation, which is only applicable to large organization with uh, a revenue of 200 million dirham or more. However, a qualifying free zone person can also not be as, uh, not uh, avail the small business relief. And any, any business having a revenue below the threshold of 3 million dirham can also not claim the small business relief. So what are the benefits of small business relief? If you are eligible for a small business relief, your total income will not be considered and you will be chargeable at the, at the tax rate of 0%. And uh, there is also a compliance uh, required. There is also an ease of compliance requirement in transfer pricing documentation. Therefore, you do not have to pay any tax and you do not have to comply with the transfer pricing documentation, uh, which is compulsory for all other business persons. Coming towards the business restructuring relief. So subject to meeting the relevant conditions, no gain or losses shall arise in a qualifying business restructuring exercise. So this includes a business merger, which is transfer of business uh, or an independent part of a business in exchange for shares or other ownership interests. A legal merger, which is taxable person transfers entire business to another taxable person under a universal title, after which the transferer is dissolved or ceased to exist. And a legal demerger, it can either be a full demerger or a partial demerger. So all of these uh, exercises will be completely tax-free. So even if there is any sort of capital gains by the sale of shares, such gains would not be taxable under this business restructuring relief. Some other very notable changes. So first of all, business can deduct net interest expenditure up to either 30% of the adjusted earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. This particular law was also applicable, uh, was also published in the previous law, which was released uh, in December 22. However, a new safe harbor amount of 12 million dirham is introduced. Therefore, if the net interest expenditure is less than this amount, the 30% restriction would not apply. In other cases, the taxable person can deduct the higher of 12 million dirham or 30% of the adjusted EBITDA. It's pertinent, note, it's pertinent to note that banks and insurance providers are excluded from this rule. Secondly, taxable persons with revenue of 50 million dirham or more are required to prepare and maintain audited financial statements. So along with audited financial statements, you also have to conduct a tax audit which, which calculates the taxable income and all the deductions uh, and exemptions that you're availing. 
also required to do so are the taxable person who come under the terms of qualifying free zone person. So how should the tax audit be conducted? Such provisions and uh, explanations along with the taxability of free zone person might be clarified and explained by the ministry further in the coming weeks. Thirdly, businesses can adjust the tax treatment of such assets and liabilities based on specific rules and must decide how to do that when they submit their first return. So businesses can choose whether to value their assets at the revaluation model or they can choose to uh, value their assets at the cost model. So this is a choice given to businesses. However, this is permanent. And lastly, business or business activities conducted by a resident or non-resident natural person shall be subject to corporate tax only where the total turnover derived from such business or business activities exceeds 1 million dirhams. So if a natural person is taxable only for their sole proprietorship or an unincorporated partnership, such income is only taxable over uh, the threshold limit of 375,000 dirhams at the rate of 9% if the total turnover is exceeding 1 million dirhams. Now coming to the point of tax registration. So according to the information provided on the FTA website, taxable persons have until the date of their first tax filing to register. So for example, if a taxable person has a year ending on 31st May 2023, they have a registration period of 26 months available until February 28, 2025. So this chart depicts this whole process. So that was it for the major updates that were released recently. Now let's quickly revise the major concepts of the corporate tax law as a whole. So again, taxable persons have to pay a 9% corporate tax on their income over 375,000 dirhams subject to various conditions for tax periods starting on or after the 1st of June, 2023. There are two uh, broad categories of taxable persons, resident person and non-resident persons. So resident persons would involve juridical person incorporated or recognized in UAE, natural persons engaged in a business activity in the UAE, or foreign companies managed and controlled in the UAE. On the other hand, non-resident persons are those persons who have a permanent establishment in the UAE, derives UAE sourced income, or has a nexus in the UAE. Moving towards the taxability of natural persons. So like I explained in the major updates, uh, individuals are only taxable for their business activity directly or indirectly through an unincorporated partnership or sole proprietorship or civil company will be subject to the UA corporate tax. So natural persons that are engaged in a business or business activity through an unincorporated partnership are individually subject to the UAE corporate tax on their share of income from such partnership, which will usually be the profit sharing ratio. The following shall not be subject to the UAE corporate tax, salaries and other employment income, real estate investment in their personal capacity, dividends and capital gains and other income earned from holding investment in their personal capacity, interest and other income from bank deposits or saving schemes, or any such other indirect income. So the only income that will be taxable is when the business activity is having a turnover of more than 1 million. There is no definite business structure. So if the taxable person is only uh, conducting business in their own personal capacity, such as a freelancer or an unincorporated partnership, only then such income will be taxable. Uh, moreover, individuals having multiple business activities that are within the scope of UA corporate tax can file a single tax return covering all their business activities. So now coming to the taxable income. So for a resident juridical person, income derived from the UAE or from outside the UAE, if it is effectively managed and controlled in the UAE, will be taxable. For a resident natural person, like we already discussed, Income derived from UAE or from outside the UAE, in so far as it relates to the business activity conducted by the natural person in the UAE. And for a non resident person, it is any income which is attributable to their permanent establishment, which can be their branch income or their agent income, UAE sourced income that is not attributable to PE, or any income attributable to the nexus of the non resident person in the UAE. 
So the calculation of taxable income in the UA corporate tax is very straightforward and uh, is similar to a lot of taxable income in other economies. So the taxable income has to be calculated based on the financial statements prepared in accordance with IFRS. Taxable income shall be recognized uh, by the accounting income as, as adjusted for the following. So any unrealized gains or losses, any exempt income, any relief for intra-group transfer and other qualifying business restructuring transactions, deductions, uh, which are all legit, all legit made business expenditure of taxable person's business, transactions with related party and connected persons, tax loss reliefs, any incentives or special release for a qualifying business activity, or any income or expenditure that has not been taken into account in determining the taxable income. So as you can see, it's a very straightforward flow of calculation of taxable income. Now coming to the specific deductions in this law. So any expenditure which is wholly and exclusively incurred for the business uh, shall be tax deductible. If an expenditure is incurred for more than one purpose, so that if it's an exempt purpose or a non-business purpose and a business pur purpose, then any identifiable part of such expenditure shall be deductible, whereas any non-identifiable part would be allocated on a fair and reasonable basis. A lot of uh, people were wondering whether the indirect expenditure conducted for qualifying and non-qualifying income on free zones, uh, how will they be apportioned? Well, the thing is, since the non-qualifying income is non-taxable, uh, if it satisfies the de minimis requirements, there is no uh, objective to apportion these two expenditure. Since anyways, if the non-qualifying income exceeds the de minimis requirements, then the entire income and entire expenditure will be taxable like a normal taxable person. Secondly, no deduction for expenses which are capital in nature or incurred for deriving exempt income. The net interest expenditure, like I explained, should be deductible only up to 34% of the EBITDA, up to a safe harbor amount of 12 million dirhams. Therefore, if the interest expenditure is less than this amount, the 30% restriction would not apply. In other cases, the taxable person can deduct the higher of 12 million or 30% of adjusted EBITDA. The excess interest is to be carried forward in subsequent 10 periods. Then no deduction shall be allowed on interest incurred on a related party loan in respect of certain transactions in the nature of profit distribution and acquisition of capital or shares of an entity except where the taxpayer can demonstrate that the purpose of the loan is for not taking any corporate tax advantage. So a lot of important points uh, can be derived from this particular sentence. First of all, any capital deduct any interest expenditure on these loans unless the corporate uh, unless the taxable person can demonstrate that the purpose of this loan for us not for taking any undue corporate tax advantage another important point that can be derived from this point is that any working capital loan any interest expenditure which is for a working capital loan from a related party is also going to be tax deductible Moreover, entertainment, amusement, and recreational expenses incurred on customers, shareholders, suppliers, or other business partners will be deductible only up to 50%. Uh, for example, meals, accommodation for clients, for suppliers, for business partners. A very important point here is that uh, employees will not be covered since any expenditure incurred on employees will be considered a perquisite, and it will not be considered as an entertainment expenditure. Lastly, no deduction will be available for these activities, which is donations, grants, gifts made to a non-qualifying or non-approved charitable organization, any fines, penalties, or other illicit payments, dividend or profit distribution or other benefits of similar nature to owners, withdrawals from business, uh, corporate tax paid, recoverable VAT, and any foreign taxes paid. So all of these expenditure will be completely non-deductible. So this is uh, a following list of exempted persons. Any government and government controlled entity, unless they conduct a business under a license. Persons engaged in extractive business and meeting certain conditions and persons engaged in non-extractive natural resource business. So just to give you all a little bit of context, uh, extractive business and non-extractive natural resource businesses are already taxed in each emirate as per the uh, specific emirates taxation. So it is not considered in the corporate tax separately. 
qualifying public benefit entity or a qualifying investment fund. There are a lot of conditions attached to both of these uh, type of uh, companies. Therefore, if you want uh, additional details, we can have a one-on-one -on -one meeting for the same. Public pension social security fund or a private pension social security fund meeting certain conditions. Juridical person incorporated in the UA that is wholly owned and controlled by an exempt person and undertakes specified activities. And lastly, any other person as may be determined by the cabinet. The following are the exempted income. So any sort of dividends or profit distribution from juridical resident person will always be completely exempted. However, any foreign dividends or other profit distribution and capital gains from sale of shares arising from participating interest will only be exempted. So I'll come back to the definition of participating interest in the next slide. It's just pertinent to note that if a UAE company is holding any shares in a foreign entity, and if the foreign entity uh, declares dividend and the UAE entity is receiving it, then such income will only be exempt if it is a participating interest. Otherwise, it will be taxable. Any other income arising from a participating interest, income from a foreign PE that meets certain conditions, and income from a non-resident person from operating aircraft or ships in international transportation. So what is participating interest? It basically is an interest of greater than or equal to 5% uh, in the ownership, rights to profits, or rights to liquidation proceeds in the juridical person. However, there are certain other conditions as well, such as the taxpayer holds or intends to hold such interest for an uninterrupted period of 12 months. So whether or not uh, you are holding it for a period of 12 months, your intention should be to hold such interest for at least a period of 12 months for it to be qualified as a participating interest. The participation is subject to corporate tax or any other tax imposed under the country in which the juridical person is a resident with a tax rate not less than 9%. So if a foreign entity is a resident in a country which is a tax haven or has a 0% corporate tax rate or has a rate which is less than 9%, then any such entities, even if it meets all the other conditions, won't be qualified as a participating interest. Furthermore, not more than 50% of the direct and indirect assets of the participation consist of ownership interest that would not qualify for the participation exemption if not held directly by the taxable person. So what this means is that if you have a company which meets all the other following conditions, however, if the participating interest company has its assets, uh, which are more than 50% of an another entity, uh, which does not meet any of these conditions, even then you would qualify as a participating interest. Lastly, any other conditions as may be prescribed in further ministerial decisions. So tax losses is a very interesting concept. Uh, losses incurred in one period can be offset against uh, the taxable income of su any subsequent future periods up to a maximum of 75% of the taxable income in each of those future periods. So say I have a company who made a tax loss of 100 dirhams in year one. If I'm making a taxable profit of 100 dirhams in year two, I can only offset 75%, which is 70 dirhams of that previous tax loss. Uh, and subsequently in year three, I can offset the remaining 25 dirhams as well. Losses can be carried forward indefinitely, provided the same shareholders hold at least 50% of the share capital from the start of the period in which a tax loss is incurred to the end of the period in which a loss is offset against the taxable income. So if there is a change in ownership of more than 50% of losses, uh, may still be carried forward provided the similar nature of business activity is carried on by the new owners. So in this period, if there is any change of shareholders, the tax loss can still be carried forward if the business activity remains the same. However, no tax loss relief will be available to the following losses. So first of all, losses incurred before the date of commencement of corporate tax. Any tax losses before 1st of June 2023 cannot be carried forward to subsequent years. Secondly, losses incurred before a person become a taxable person under this decree law. So say the corporate tax is effective from the 1st of June 2023. But if a person is liable to be a taxable person in the year 2026, then he cannot claim any tax losses between the period of 2023 and 2026. 
it is only applicable once the the taxable person is registered under the corporate tax lastly losses incurred from an asset or activity the income of which is exempt or otherwise not taken into account under this decree law transfer of losses so a tax loss or a portion thereof may be offset against the taxable income of another taxable person where all of the following conditions are met so first of all both taxable person a juridical and resident persons one company cannot be a foreign entity secondly either taxable person has a direct or indirect ownership of at least 75% in the other or a third person has a direct or indirect ownership of at least 75% in each of the taxable person so basically this can be uh, visualized as a group structure so if one company has an ownership interest of at least 75% in the another company this condition is satisfied however even if this condition is not satisfied but a common company has an interest of 75% in both of these companies the two companies are eligible uh, to transfer losses thirdly none of the persons are either exempt or a qualifying free zone person so a qualifying free zone person cannot transfer any tax losses or cannot receive any tax losses the financial year of each of the taxable persons ends on the same date both taxable persons prepare their financial statements using the same accounting standards which is ifrs and the total tax loss offset shall not exceed the 75% of taxable income like we saw in the previous slide so tax losses can be carried forward indefinitely to subsequent tax periods where there is either a continuity of ownership which is the same person or persons continuously uh, own 50% ownership interest or a continuity of business or business activity like we saw in the last slide now a very interesting concept transfer pricing and grant provisions so tp regulations will apply on transactions between related parties and or connected persons including the foreign jurisdictions so any sort of foreign jurisdiction if an entity is located in any country other than the uae the transfer pricing will still apply so it's basically for domestic as well as foreign transactions excess payments to connected persons that is directors officers owners and the related parties of all such connected persons that do not correspond to the market value shall not be allowed as a deductible expense a taxable person may be required by the authority to disclose all such information on transactions and arrangements they have with the related parties and connected persons together with their tax returns so basically there will be an extra disclosure a separate disclosure all that will have we have to be submitted to the tax authorities uh, along with your tax return and separate disclosures might be requested by the government which have to be submitted to the authority within a period of 30 days from the date of the request so the authorities may also require such information such as how did you calculate the arms length price or why was such a transaction uh, why was such a transaction implemented even if it lacked commercial substance so the government is expected to be very strict with transfer pricing laws so that it avoids any sort of tax avoidance and tax shifting and lastly transaction between taxable person and its related party should be on the arms length price the arms length price will be computed as per the five methods prescribed by the oecd which is the comparable uncontrolled price method the resale price method the cost plus method the transactional net margin method and the profit split method and any other reasonable methods so if you want to uh, get a detailed information about all of these methods which method will be applicable to you we can have a one on one meeting later and we can explain the whole transfer pricing provisions in detail so what is what all parties will be covered under the purview of related parties first of all related party will be two or more individuals related within the fourth degree of kinship or affiliation this is a, a sort of an extent of relationships that i will explain in the next slide secondly any relationship between an individual and a legal entity where alone or together with other related parties the individual or directly or indirectly owns uh, an interest more than 50% share in or the controls the other legal entity similarly two or more legal entities where one legal entity alone or together with related parties directly or indirectly owns an interest which is more than 50% or controls the other legal entity 
Similarly, two or more legal entities, if any person, which is either natural or juridical, alone or with a related party directly or indirectly owns an interest which is more than 50% or controls them. So all these uh, conditions are very similar, but at the same time, it depicts a sort of a group structure with both legal entities and individual natural persons. Furthermore, a taxpayer and its permanent establishment. So any permanent establishment like a agent or a branch office will be considered as a related party, even though the whole taxable income will be included in your taxable income. Lastly, partners in the same unincorporated partnership or trustees, founders, settlers of the same trust. So this uh, definition is extremely wide. It's uh, I'll come to the relationship part in the next slide. So the fourth degree of affiliation between two natural persons uh, is as follows. So the first degree relative is a parent and a child. A second degree relative is a grandparent, a sibling of an individual or a grandchild. The third degree relative will be a great grandparent, an uncle or an aunt, niece or a nephew, a great grandchild. Sorry. And a fourth degree relative will be a great, great grandparent, an uncle or an aunt, cousins, great niece, nephew, great grandchild. So as you can see, the, the definition and purview of relationships and related party the relationships is quite wide and it's wider than a lot of other complex economies such as India as well. So it is very important to identify all such related parties so that whenever there is any transactions between this related party, uh, proper disclosure is presented to avoid any sort of penalties in the future. Now, coming to the very interesting general anti-abuse rules. The general anti-abuse rules is uh, sort of a law which is present so that in case a taxable person manages to find a loophole in any of these other conditions, this rule will make a corresponding tax adjustment uh, so that this avoidance is, uh, this tax avoidance is prevented. A very interesting fact about this law is that this general anti-abuse rules were, was effective way before uh, the corporate tax law was even live. So the, the guard provisions are applicable from April 2022. They are still applicable. So any fishy transactions or restructuring uh, that has been done by taxable persons to avoid such kind of tax avoidance may be scrutinized and a corresponding tax adjustment might be made to the entities even in the future. So non-exhaustive list of examples that are considered a corporate tax advantage uh, are a refund or an increased refund of corporate tax or the avoidance or reduction of corporate tax payable or the deferral or payment of corporate tax or the advancement of a refund of a corporate tax and the avoidance of an obligation to deduct or account for corporate tax and a non-exhaustive list of actions that can be taken by the authority in case of such abuse is either they can allow or disallow an exemption, deduction or relief so that your taxable income is adjusted by that same deduction, recharacterizing the nature of a payment or other amount of the purposes. They can recharacterize your deductions and convert it into a taxable income or they can impose penalties on the same and disregarding the effect of the purpose of the corporate tax law that would otherwise result from the application of other provisions of corporate tax law. So it is very important that whenever you're planning any sort of restructuring uh, to avoid, to reduce the corporate tax liability, you have to ensure that your GAR, uh, your amounts, and the substance that you're imposing with this restructuring uh, abides by the GAR provisions. Otherwise, there might be significant penalties and tax liabilities in the future. Coming to the topic of tax groups and branches. So uh, a lot of companies have their subsidiaries in other Emirates uh, or in the mainland in Dubai. And UAE parent entity can make an application to the entity, uh, to the FTA to form a tax group with its uh, UAE subsidiaries. So conditions for eligibility for a tax group include a 95% ownership requirement. Secondly, neither parent nor subsidiary can be a qualifying free zone person or exempt person. All companies must use the same financial year and accounting standards. Threshold of 375,000 dirham will apply to the tax group as a single taxpayer, irrespective of the number of entities in the tax group. The unutilized tax losses of a subsidiary joining a tax group shall become the carried forward tax losses of the tax group and can be used to offset the taxable income of the tax group 
but the same is not permitted for losses incurred by the subsidiary before joining the group. So say a subsidiary is joining a, a large tax group, wherein the subsidiary has significant tax losses that were uh, that were imposed before uh, it joined the tax group. All such tax losses cannot be set off against the income of the tax group in the subsequent periods. Benefits uh, of a tax group include reduced compliance requirements, such as filing a single corporate tax return by the parent company and participants. Uh, and participants would not be required to comply with transfer pricing regulations for intra-group transfers. So any transactions which are done between the subsidiaries in a tax group would not be applicable for transfer pricing do uh, documentation, uh, such as the disclosure that has to be filed with the corporate tax return. Now, what about branches? So like we already discussed, branches are a, for, are a sort of a, a permanent establishment. They can either be domestic, such as in the mainland UAE, or they can be a foreign branch. The income of UAE branches will be included in the taxable income in the UAE corporate tax return of their UAE or parent head office. A UAE branch of a foreign business would be subject to the UAE corporate tax unless the activities of the branch do not give rise to a PE in the UAE. The income of foreign branches or foreign PE of a UAE business will be included in the taxable income and the UAE corporate tax return of the UAE HO unless the business elects to claim foreign branch profits exemption. So say you have a branch uh, in the USA and the USA branch is making significant profits. Unless you apply for a foreign branch profit exemption, the entire income by the UAE branch will be taxable for your UAE headquarters. Lastly, where no election is made or the income of the foreign branch or P is not eligible for an exemption, the UAE corporate tax payable on the income of the foreign branch or P can be reduced by the tax paid in the foreign jurisdiction. So even if you have not made the election for a foreign branch profit exemption, foreign uh, permanent establishment exemption, you can still set off whatever taxes you have paid in the US by the income that is generated there and only the net income will be taxable in the UAE. So that was it from my side. Thank you so much for being wonderful guests. And let's have a very fruitful Q&A session wherein you can ask all of your doubts. Uh, and uh, along with me, Mr. Deepan Shah can join me in answering these questions. So Mr. Akshay has asked the question that say company ABC DMCC is in the business of diamonds. If revenue comprises of 5% or more in exports or exports are above 5 million dirham, are we then liable uh, to pay tax? Well, the short answer is yes. Uh, if you have uh, any such income, which is a non-qualifying income, so that if, if you're established in the DMCC company, and you're doing any such transactions which include a trading activity, uh, which are exports, then all such your entire income uh, of the call of the free zone will be taxable since you won't be uh, liable, you won't be a qualifying free zone person afterwards. So another question is, do we need to register even if uh, we are below the threshold? or have qualifying income as a free zone company? The answer is yes. Even if you are a qualifying free zone company and you are satisfying the de minimis requirement uh, and your income is below the threshold, you still have to register yourself as a corporate tax person. And you will also have to comply with all the necessary compliances. So you'll have to file the corporate tax return. You'll have to get your accounts audited. You'll have to file a transfer pricing disclosure all the compliances that is applicable to a mainland company will also be applicable to a qualifying free zone person. So Deepan Bhai, do you want to take uh, the next questions?
Uh, yes, Neil. Uh, next question is company ABC DMCC is in the business of diamonds. What will be the implication for sale from DMCC company to LSC company? So that will be considered as a non qualifying income and it will be uh, it will be required to uh, calculate whether this qualify for D minimus requirement or not. So just to elaborate uh, on that answer. So like we discussed the D minimus requirement is 5% of your total revenue or 5 million dirham, whichever is lower. So if you are having any trading activities from, from a DMCC company to a LLC company, and this revenue from the DMCC company to LLC company is more than 5% of your total revenue, which excludes the disqualifying revenue or 5 million dirham, whichever is lower, then your entire income will be taxable as a non-qualifying free zone person. So will, you will basically be taxable like a normal tax person. Okay, uh, new. Uh, can you just uh, take a uh, next question? I will answer another question in reply to this uh, message. That will be fine, okay. I think. Sure. So the next question is, could you repeat on the distinction between non-qualifying and disqualifying activity? So I think it's better if I go to that slide itself. So as you can see here, the non-qualifying income is activities that are not qualifying activities. So like we saw, there are 12 different activities prescribed by the ministry, which even if you are doing it with a mainland company or a foreign entity as an export, this entire income will be considered as a qualifying income since it is a qualifying activity. However, if you are transacting with a mainland company or a foreign entity, which is not a qualifying activity, then this entire income will be considered as a non-qualifying income. Secondly, revenue from excluded activities. So there was a small list of excluded activities uh, that we saw. Uh, and this entire excluded activities income, even if you are transacting it within the free zone, it will still be taxable. Uh, it will still be considered as a non-qualifying income. However, the very important aspect to understand is that even if your non-qualifying income is less than 5% of your, uh, if, if the non-qualifying income is satisfying the de minimis requirements, then your entire qualifying and non-qualifying income is exempt. So if the 5% requirement or 5 million dirham, whichever is lower is met, then even your non-qualifying income is going to be exempt. Disqualifying income is just a separate part. So there is no sort of threshold limit uh, of 375,000 dirhams or the, or the de minimis requirement. Disqualifying will be taxed separately and such income, uh, the net income from, say you are selling a property, which is, uh, which is a residential property in the free zone. And it is not in your personal name, but in your company's name. And you're selling it to a non-free zone person or any person within the free zone. Such income will be directly taxed at the rate of 9%. Uh, and, this, uh, and this income will be your net income. So say you are having some sort of commission charges, some other taxes that you are paying, you will only be taxed at the rate of 9%. And secondly, income from any domestic or foreign permanent establishment. So if you are having any branch income, any agent income that is within the mainland or which is a foreign income, this entire branch income will also be taxed at the rate of 9%. Uh, however, even this is the net income. So if your branch are having expenses such as rent expenses, you know, purchases, the net income, the net profit will be taxed at the rate of 9%. I hope uh, you understand, you understood that from me. So another question is from Mr. Bharat. We are a DMCC company operating with local custom code. And if we sell to free zone, will it attract corporate tax? So uh, like I said, any sort of activity that are done to another free zone, or if you're doing it within the DMCC itself, any free zone, this is, this is not only applicable to designated free zones. If you are a free zone company selling to any other free zone, then all such activities, even if they are non-qualifying activities will be considered qualifying income. However, if you're selling it to mainland or any exports, then you will have to see whether your activities are falling under the qualifying activities. 
If not, then you will have to check the de minimis requirements. I hope that answers your question, Mr. Bharat. So, Mr. Ben Eagle has a question that if a company ABC has a loan from a silent shareholder, would the interest on this loan be deductible? Even though the interest is from a related party, it is a core need for the business to continue operating. So, like I said, if it is a, if it is a loan of a capital nature, if that loan is considered for buying any machinery or you know, utilizing it for business expansion, then this entire interest expenditure will be non-deductible unless you demonstrate to the ministry that it is not for corporate tax avoidance. If you demonstrate the same, this entire interest expenditure is deductible. However, if the, if the loan is only a working capital loan, even if it is from a silent shareholder, then the entire income will be anyways deductible. I hope that answers your question. So Mr. Derek is asking, do we have non-qualifying income as a DMCC company? Yes. So this entire, the three categories of income are only for free zone. So qualifying, non-qualifying and disqualifying income are only applicable for free zone entities. Uh, yes, uh, Faimuddin, I uh, will share this uh, PPT to all our participants in this one. Uh, Mr. Rajesh, I think uh, I've explained this question. The, the answer to your question is repeated multiple times. So I hope you got it. Is there, if there is any other query, please uh, let us know. So a question is, if a DMCC entity has a related party income, from a non-UAE entity, is this income exempt from the corporate tax? So the answer is, it depends on whether it is a qualifying income or a non-qualifying income. If your related party income is coming from a qualifying activity, then the entire income will be qualifying income and it will be exempt. However, if it is a non-qualifying activity, uh, then since it is a non-UAE entity and is considered an export, and if, if, if it is a non-qualifying activity, then this income won't be exempt. It will be considered as non-qualifying income. So uh, there's a question, could you elaborate further on the concept of beneficial recipient in the context of service? So like I explained, there is a provision that the free zone company has to be the beneficial recipient. So in case the beneficial recipient, so in case a free zone entity has an obligation that whatever income is received, so say you are selling us selling uh, professional services to free zone persons. However, this entire income is going directly going to a mainland entity or a foreign entity. So say you have an obligation to pay your entire income to a non free zone person, then the beneficial recipient is outside the free zone and hence the ministry might uh, if they do some sort of periodic inspection or if they scrutinize your accounts and if this, they find out that this obligation is there, they might revoke your free zone exemption. So Vincent, if we uh, so Mr. Vincent is asking a question, if we have income from trading list trading in listed shares, does it fall under qualifying income? So the answer is that if you are doing it from within the free zone, it won't be, uh, it won't, it, there is no requirement of a qualifying activity because it is anyways a qualifying income. However, if it, uh, if it is from outside the uh, free zones or if it's, a, if it's from outside the UAE, then this entire income will not be considered as qualifying income. So a question from Mr. Tejas is if the company in DMCC, the business of e-commerce marketing services and exports above less than 1 million 
uh, would it impact corporate tax? So what I understood from this question is you are an e-commerce marketing company, uh, which is giving a service of e-commerce marketing. And if you have an income less than 1 million or just exports less than 1 million, would it impact the corporate tax? It depends. So first of all, if your exports is more than 5% of your total revenue, then anyways, you are no longer, and since e-commerce marketing services is not a qualifying activity, if you are exporting such services and it is more than 5% of your total revenue, then you are no longer going to be a qualifying free zone person. However, the good news for you is that the qualifying freeze, even if you're not a qualifying free zone person, you can take a small business relief. If your income is less than 3 million dirham, in which case you do not have to pay any corporate tax and you will be exempted from a lot of transfer pricing disclosures and documentation as well. I hope it answers your question. So there's a question from Mr. Bharat. If I have a property in DMCC and tenant is also DMCC, then rent will be taxable or not. Uh, the simple answer is it will depend on whether the property is a commercial property or a residential property. If it is a commercial property, and even if that if the tenant is a, tax, uh, a free zone person, then this entire rent income will be exempted. On the other hand, if it is a residential property, then the entire income will be considered as a disqualifying income and you'll have to pay directly a tax at the rate of 9% without any threshold limit. Uh, Mr. Derek, uh, so there's a question, how do we make sure we do not fall into any taxable situation? Uh, very interesting question. I think, uh, I think everyone would be wondering the same. So, we can definitely plan out a meeting one on one. We can explain uh, your business activities, your sources of income, sources of expenditure in detail. And we can find out a way to uh, minimize the corporate tax impact. So, I think we've had a lot of questions right now. Uh, in case there is any other question, please feel free uh, to message me on WhatsApp or uh, send me an email. Uh, I'll be happy to answer all of your questions. I'll also be happy to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with everyone to discuss your tax impact and liability. Uh, we will surely share the PPT to everyone and uh, we'll also upload this entire recording on YouTube. So in case you, all, you want to further uh, check any part of this entire presentation again, maybe a YouTube video would be much better. So we'll send you the link of the YouTube video uh, in the trailing mail to this webinar. Uh, I hope uh, everyone is uh, clear with the concepts taught and uh, uh, I hope that it, would, it was useful for you. So in case you have any further queries, please let me know and have a good day. Thank you so much.